tonight for our Wednesday evening devotional as we look at the text coming from Luke chapter 1 verses 67 to 69 in the announcements that were emailed out earlier today there is a line that says that we're asking people to send a picture with themselves and their grandparents it can be a child or adult alike and we need those pictures to be sent by September 8th to Abby Book and her email address is in that announcement. And so we're in the process of putting together uh, some things. Abby is uh, in the process of putting together something for Gr Grandparents Day, which comes up on Sunday the 11th. So please email that in by September the 8th. Isaac Watts was a genius. At the age of four, he had learned Latin. At the age of nine, he had learned Greek. At the age of 11, he had learned French. And by the time he was 13, he had learned Hebrew. Not only that, he was well known for his poetic reworking of the Psalms, which has been called magnificent from people that have read the studies and the Psalms that he did. Of all these great things, unfortunately for Isaac Watts, he was not known for his good looks. He's not known to be a handsome man at all. His one chance at love came when he met a young lady by the name of Elizabeth Singer, who actually fell in love with him, not by meeting him, having never seen him. She fell in love with him just by reading his poetry. She thought a man that can write that deeply the poetic words certainly would be someone that she would want to marry. She actually asked him to marry her in a letter that he wrote, but whenever they finally met in person, she retracted the offer. She later wrote about Isaac Watts, that he was only five feet tall, with a shallow face, a hooked nose, a prominent cheekbones, small eyes, and a death-like color. She said, I admired the jewel, but not the casket that contained it. Thus, Isaac, Isaac never married. He spent his single life focused on the glory of God. He was known as a preacher. He was known as a poet. He was known as a writer with many books, a theologian, a logician. He's known for writing books in logic. Of all the things he was known most for, though, he was known for his hymns as a hymn writer. In fact, over 750 hymns are credited to him. Titles that we're familiar with were Marching to Zion, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross, and perhaps one of the most well-known songs of all, Joy to the World. And as we continue our series today, Prepare the way. Looking at the life of John the Baptist, we come to one of the many songs in Scripture. It's called simply in Latin, the Benedictus, or Benedictus. This chapter 1 of Luke 67 to 80, it's taken from the first words of the song in Latin, which say Benedictus Dominus Deus, which means praise be to the Lord God. This is sort of a one-hit wonder for Zechariah, at least we're not known of, not told of any other songs that he wrote before this or after this. It seems to be something that came at this time and at this moment at the naming of John. There were so many priests in, in Israel that it would be possible for a priest to go months without being called to temple duty. But Zechariah, as we saw, had his dream come true. He, his lot was cast. And not only was his lot cast, but he had the opportunity of a lifetime to offer the incense offering there on the altar of incense. And when a priest offered incense, he would be standing right in front, or close to the veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place. Right behind that veil was the presence 
of God, the Shekinah glory. Only the high priest went into that veil and he but once a year. A priest who gets to offer this incense is called rich and holy for the rest of their life. And when the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah with this announcement of a birth, John, and what he would do, Zechariah is in disbelief. After all, Zechariah is, well, in our culture, he would be a member of the AARP. He would be already drawing Social Security, having retired. Now, keep in mind, priests never retired in Israel. But in our culture, at this older age, he would have already retired. So that helps us identify with where he is at, at his age. He was totally caught off guard. How can this be? And because he was caught off guard and in, in disbelief, he was sentenced to silence and perhaps deafness for the duration of this pregnancy, nine months. There would be a pregnancy, there would be a birth, and as soon as the name John was given, his mouth would be opened. It's amazing when you consider it that the first words that he uttered after this, this, these nine months was, his name is John. Then these words of, of praise come after his, after this naming out of his mouth right after this. These are the first words that he says. You must have been thinking, dwelling on these thoughts all the time during this pregnancy. I mean, if you were not able to speak for some time and suddenly you had the gift of speaking back, the ability, ability to speak back, what's the first thing you would say? These are the first things he says as soon as his mouth is opened and his tongue is loosened. It's been called the Song of Zechariah. It's been called the Song Before Sunrise. It's been called the Day Spring. And it is written in three parts, the past, the present, and the future. First of all, Zechariah, well, he looks to the past. Notice in verse 67 of chapter 1, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. The word prophesy can mean to preach, to proclaim, to forecast the future, tell the future, speak of future events. In this case, Zechariah is filled with the Spirit and he does all three. The prophetic voice of the Lord had been silent now for over 400 years, Malachi having spoken last, until all of a sudden Gabriel arrives with a prophetic word. Elizabeth, when she visits with Mary, when she's told of the baby that she'll bear, has prophetic words, speaking words that God's given to her to say. And then Mary, too, speaks words that God gives to her to say, through the angel, and now through Zechariah, this, these prophetic speaking that's taking place in this chapter. God is clearly at work. God has spoken again, and it's all about Jesus and his work and what he's going to accomplish. Verse 68 continues, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. Notice it says that God has come to his people, emphasizing that he, in his care for people, it has now moved him to draw near. It has moved him to action. And the reason he comes, he comes to redeem us, which is to rescue at a high price, at an extreme cost to himself, to free us from the slavery of sin. Redemption paints the picture of, of releasing a prisoner or liberating a slave. And Jews knew fully well from their history what it was like. The stories that were told of slavery under Egypt and what it was like to be treated harshly by them, but then to be liberated by God from that slavery. God's mercy and love are demonstrated here by action. In these verses that we read in this song, it is God who is at work, he who is drawn near, he who has raised, he who has promised nine different times in this entire chapter, it says he has, speaking of what God has done. Verse 69 continues, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. The horn of an animal represents and is symbolic of the strength of that animal, the power. They, animals often use their horns 
in a fight, as a display of power and strength. And to say that God has raised up a horn of salvation is to say that, that we have a mighty Savior, a mighty salvation, a powerful Savior, a powerful salvation, one who has the power to finish what he has started, one who has the power to keep his promises, even though they were made eons ago. Daniel once in a vision saw what he called a tiny horn. It was representative of counterfeit gods that did not have the power. But this is a horn representing God's full power. Notice Zechariah sings of the servant David. He's bringing back the promise concerning the house of David that there will a king will come from Judah and will sit on your throne and that kingdom will reign forever. He celebrates the fact that he's remembered this covenant with David who one day will have a descendant that will display this power on, his, on the throne. And that takes place at the birth of Jesus. His birth would be physically miraculous because he's born of a virgin. And Jesus at his birth would be legally in the dynasty of David's lineage through his legal father, Joseph. And he would be biologically in the line of David through the physical line of Mary. A truth that, that I'm sure even Zechariah, as he sang these words publicly, solo, in front of those who were there, had no way of understanding. And yet, he praised Jesus before he was born. He loved him. He was zealous for him, even before his birth. We know so much more now about Jesus than Zechariah did at that time. But Jesus is the horn of salvation. He is the one who will rescue us from our enemies, who will redeem us, who will pour out and pour, pour out his love and mercy upon us as has been promised. Notice verse 70 says, Zechariah says, as he said, all of this is what he has said through his holy prophets of long ago. There were many prophets of long ago, but they all had a consistent voice that there would be a promised Messiah. So Zechariah praises God for keeping his promises, for remembering the promise he made to David. This is what makes God distinct and different from any other foreign gods out there, is that God is able to bind himself to a promise. And no matter how much time passes by, keep that promise years and years and years later. Someone has counted there are 456 very specific and detailed signs and prophecies concerning the birth of Jesus in the Old Testament. And when God makes a promise, it's not halfway fulfilled. Even down to the very details, these promises are fulfilled. God, God that differentiate, it differentiates God from any other false god in the world. Not only does he keep his promises, but they are kept down to the specifics. God does exactly what he says he will do in his time, in his way, for his glory, and for our good. 71 continues then. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Zechariah's focus is spiritual, that Jesus will come and he will deliver us from the power of Satan, from the power of sin, from the power of, of death. He praises God for remembering the promise that he made to Abraham at time on the mount of Moriah, where he was led to sacrifice his son Isaac in full obedience down to the dropping of the knife when God stops his arm. When the angel of the Lord appears, stops his arm and, and makes this promise to him that he will have a great nation and that all peoples will be blessed through him and that someone will come who will be a deliverer, one who redeems. Notice that it says that that we can now serve him without fear. What a beautiful prophetic statement that Zechariah makes here. Because of Jesus, we can follow him fully and completely. 
and trust and obedience. We can go to bed at night without having any fear of, of bad news that might take place or a bad event. You see, the bad news can never overtake the power of the good news. The good news overpowers the, the bad news, rather, rather. Because of Jesus, we can look at death without fear. And we can look to the one who has, who has died and is now resurrected. Because of Jesus, we can follow him completely without fear. One of the most often repeated commands in Scripture is do not fear. And we can believe that because of Jesus. A missionary once returned back to the village that he had ministered to for so many years. And when he arrived, he noticed smoke was coming from the village. The, the houses made of straw and thatch roofs were burned to the ground. People were just gathered around looking for their belongings. He couldn't believe what this enemy tribe had done to these people. One man was there and said, that he, how sad he was that not only his Bible, but his hymnal was burned completely to a crisp. As they were walking through the rubble, they saw a sheet of paper that partially was burned, but part of it was not. And on it was written, is that it, all that was left that you could read was that the Lord has come. And the man that saw this said, that's enough for me. No matter this disaster, the Lord has come. No matter what you're facing, the Lord has come. No matter what you're dealing with in life, the Lord has come, and we can serve him without fear. That's Zechariah looking to the past, looking to the past promises and how they would be fulfilled in prophecy in Jesus and what he accomplishes. But then he looks to the present. He's holding the baby, I believe, while he's saying these words, singing this to those who are there. And he says in verse 76, And you, my child, speaking now to John, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Zechariah is telling us that God did not visit this planet, did not come to this planet to see how we're doing. He already knows how we're doing. He came to visit this planet because we needed something. And John's mission, Zechariah here explains, is to prepare the way for that message, to, to share some things about God. John's message would be a message about repentance. John's message would be a message about the remission, the forgiveness of sins. John's message would be a message about our desperate need for a Savior must all of us, there's not a single one of us that can ever say that I'm without sin. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which is why we need his message today, just like they did back then. We're constantly needed to be reminded that we, of our desperate need for a Savior, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and the thanksgiving we offer for the forgiveness of sins. John was the... In this prophecy, this song, Zechariah proclaims that John was the true prophet of the Most High God, that he had a unique calling to prepare the way for the Lord, and that he would give the knowledge of salvation. What an amazing thought, that the people could be saved through the forgiveness of their sins. His, his message of repentance his message of the knowledge of God was so powerful that it spread far and wide. Hundreds, thousands of people gathered around him in the wilderness when he began to teach, which he has not begun that ministry yet. People traveled from the hillside to hear him. John had his own list of disciples. His message even traveled as far as Corinth, Galatia, and Ephesus, and further regions beyond that. That's how powerful his message was. And as great as he was at delivering this message, there would come a time when he would step out of the way because the one who's coming after him, he, John would say, he must become greater. I must become less. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and loose his sandals. After looking at the past and the present, 
Zechariah now looks to the future. He says in verse 78 of chapter 1, the cause of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Zechariah now turns his attention to the future, to the birth of the Messiah, and just what he would accomplish. He looked to the past to understand the promises that were spoken of old, the covenants that were made of the Messiah, and what God would accomplish through him. He looked at his son John to look at the pres present and what John's role would be, but now to the future to speak to what impact will the Messiah have when Jesus is born, what result will it have? Well, to, to those who trust and follow him, there will be a spiritual transformation as described here. They will begin to serve him. There will be also an emotional transformation. They can now serve him without fear. But there's also a behavioral transformation. They will serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence. What a beautiful promise of transformation that is promised here. This is a picture of the church, the role of the church, the establishment of the early Christians and the growth of the church and the role of transforming uh, people into the likeness of Christ the church has and the role he has in transforming us in our own lives. He came so that we, were, who, we who were lost in sin might be lifted up to the service of God to now serve him. He came so that we who served another master in this world might now turn to worship God, our creator. He came so that we who lived in fear could now be reconciled to God and serve him without fear, that we who were disconnected from him could now be connected to him. He came so that we who were at one day, at one point, not, not pleasing to God because of our sin, could now be pleasing to God because of the cleansing of sin. He came so that we who were unholy could now be made holy in his sight. This is indeed the picture of the work of Christ working through his church, the bride. That's the transforming power that takes place of, of Christ coming to this earth. Zechariah's song closes with one final burst of praise. It's about the light that enters into this world. He uses three very picturesque phrases to help us understand the impact of this light of Jesus. It means Jesus arriving, first of all, means that the rising sun from heaven, Jesus, will shine his light and notice it talks about the rising sun. It's, it's a picture of being dark, but you can see the sun rising on the horizon. Morning has broken. The day star has risen. And so the picture here is that in the midst of that darkness, God sends Jesus as light into this world. It also means the end of hopeless living. There is now purpose in our lives to shine on those who live in darkness and live in the shadow of death this pictures those who are like someone on death row who has no hope of life. Suddenly, they experience freedom and life given to them. There's no longer hopeless living. There's living with hope. And it means God's guidance. Because Jesus has come, the impact is God's guidance to an amazing end. And that end is that he guides our feet into the way of peace. And this peace is not the absence of strife. It is peace in the midst of the storm. Peace of God that passes all understanding. This is the difference that Jesus makes in the world. The shadows flee away, released from prison, the prison of, of sin and death, and our feet walk the path of peace with God, the impact of Jesus Christ. That's what Zechariah sing about in this song. And as we look at this world today, we see darkness all around. And as much as they needed that light, we need it too. The light of Jesus Christ shining through the life of, of his people. And we can be thankful that no matter how dark it gets, there's always the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
Zechariah is quoting here from Malachi 2 when he says, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in its wings, healing in his wings. It closes out with this postscript, Luke 180, and the child grew and became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. It says the child grew, which means the promises of God came to fruition in John's life. And God sends him out into the wilderness just like he has done with so many others. After all, the wilderness is the training ground he uses for his teachers, for his prophets, for his servants. This gives us a beautiful picture of of Christ, the Messiah, looking to the past, looking to what the prophets had spoken, the covenants that were made, and what Jesus would accomplish, looking to the birth of John the Baptist, who would be the forerunner to prepare the way, and now looking to the future of Jesus' birth and the impact of that birth on every person who's ever lived. There's preparation here. There's the mention of knowledge here, the knowledge of God. There is the forgiveness of God. There is the walking and the way of peace to serve God without fear ever again. What Zechariah looked for in the future, brothers and sisters in Christ, we already have the joy of experiencing. You see, it was just a short six months after John the Baptist was born that Jesus was born. And right away, these, his growth throughout the years, God began to work through him to accomplish these very things that Zechariah spoke of in this song of prophecy. We have Jesus today in the here and now. He's, he's been born, he has lived, he's died, and he is now resurrected. And what we look for Jesus now is not only in this life, but we also look for him in his final coming when he will return on that day of judgment and the books are opened, as the scriptures teach. As a ship was coming home one time with a missionary and his wife, they had traveled and they'd served for over 40 years in mission work. When they arrived, they noticed that the president was also arriving at that same dock and there was a large group there to celebrate the president. There was a band there were large crowds, there were political leaders, there must have been hundreds of people that were there applauding the arrival of the president. But whenever he saw where he was arriving at, there was no one there. He felt kind of a sense of, of loathing, if you will, of, of wound inside because he, he said, the president gets all these people celebrating him, but me and my wife, we come back and there's no one here. He talked to the Lord about it and he came back and he talked to his wife. And at first he was so hurt because people weren't here to receive him. But then his wife answered, talked to him and said, well, you seem like you're in better spirits now. And he said, well, I talked to the Lord about it. And the Lord reminded me that even though the president received this celebration when he returned home, we have yet to return home. So there's not gonna be a celebration there will be a celebration one day when we do return home, a giant, great reunion in the sky. God has promised that Jesus will return and how important it is to have our names written in the book of life. Ultimately, this is the song of an old man who held a child that was promised to him in his old age and contemplated the amazing impact and role that his son is going to have in the place of the Messiah. After all, nothing like this had ever happened before, and Zechariah had never experienced this. This was the first time, so it's only normal that he erupts in praise. God has visited, had, God has visited us before in the person of Jesus Christ, and today that same divine visitor in the form of Jesus Christ still knocks on the door of our heart, and he is alive. And he asked the question, will we open the door and let him in? Can you hear the sound of his presence? He stands patiently at the door waiting for us to open and let him enter. And will we respond like Zechariah and let him enter with songs of praise? Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for this song of scripture, this powerful message of the song of Zechariah, considering the past promises you've made, remembering also, Father, the role of John the Baptist and especially the impact that Jesus had. Thank you for sending your Savior to redeem, to forgive, that we can now serve him without fear and that we can trust in him fully and completely in the knowledge of God. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.